Yeah. Okay, we're ready to go. Okay, my name is Ed Clendenin. We're at the 2007 uh, annual reunion of the 376 Bombardment Group. It's uh, September 7th. And your name is? Les Rokamp. And I'm glad to be able to be here. Okay. It's been a long time ago since we went through this thing. And when, when, we, when and where were you born? In Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, I turned 18 in December. In March, I was in the United States Army Air Force. December of 41? Or 43. 43, you, you, you turned 18. Uh, in, in 42. Uh, okay, December 42. You no, December 42, I, I turned 18. And uh, March of 43, I was in the Army Air Force. Army Air Force. And and it's, back then, it was the Army, Army Air, Force, Air Force, right. right. And did you have a particular, um, why did you pick the Army Air Force? Is it close to the I was, I was, Navy? I was drafted into it. Oh, you were drafted into right. the Navy? Right. Before I could get into the Navy, I was going to go into the Navy, but they got me before I, I see. able to. But I guess they put me in the Air Force because I worked on a small airport. I was going to be an aircraft mechanic at one time. Oh, okay. So they put me in there, and they probably needed aircraft gunners. So where did, where did you go through your training? I went through basic training in St. Petersburg, Florida, and through armament school in uh, Denver, Colorado, uh -huh. Buckley Field, and Lowry Field. Uh -huh. From there, went to Salt Lake City, where I was... A time assigned to a crew, uh -huh. and from there we went to crew training in Pueblo, Colorado, on B-24s. And who was your who was the pilot? Of My pilot was uh, Vaughn Steele. Wow. And he was a good one too. Okay. I was lucky. Okay. Yes, and uh, half about halfway through that we were transferred to Westover Field in Massachusetts. Uh -huh. And after we finished our training, we went to. Uh, Long Island, New York, picked up a B-24 and flew the southern route to uh, to Europe. Did Went, you ferry to Plain Over? Yes. Okay. Stopped at West Palm Beach, uh, Trinidad, Belém, Brazil, Natal, Brazil. Uh -huh. From Natal, Brazil, we flew across the ocean to uh, Dakar, Africa, which was a 12-hour flight. That's right. a long time. Yeah, from, there to Marrakech, Tunisia, and wound up at San Pancrazio, Italy, where we were assigned to the 376 512 Bomb Squadron. What, 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 when did you arrive? What year, month? It was in uh, April. April of 44? April of 44. And uh, the plane you ferried over, did you keep the plane or was the plane in the... I have no idea what happened to that plane. Uh, my pilot tells me it was a... Uh, Trouble to fly. It had, uh, really? it had problems with it, and I don't know whatever happened to it. But we didn't fly the same plane all the time. We flew whatever plane was available. So you don't even know if the plane stayed with the 370? I have no idea whether it did or not. Yeah. And so what, what position in the crew were you? I was a uh, ball turret. I mean, no, I mean, sorry, top turret gunner. Top turret. Yes. So were you the radio or the flight engineer? No, I was the armor, armor gunner. Armor I took gunner. care of the guns and ammunition, things like that. And uh, the, our radio operator was a waste gunner. Our engineer was a waste gunner. And, uh, okay. and from there on, we had tail gunner, nose gunner, and a ball turret gunner. Okay. And uh, so I, my first mission was uh, Ploesti, one of our favorite rough targets. Uh -huh. And uh, on that one, we got pretty badly shot up. Uh, we lost uh, most of the left rudder, had the left tire shot out. And uh, on landing, that's why I said we had a good pilot. He held it up as long as he possibly could. And when it finally settled down, we wound up on the left side of the runway on the uh, nose and the left wing. Huh? And uh, nobody, was nobody was really hurt, just got shook up a bit. And what date was that first mission? That was in April of... Uh, Around the 20th, something rather. Okay, and Pulaski was your. Pulaski is the first one, and I went over five times so after that. Were, I was about to ask you how many times did you go to Pulaski? Five times. Five times, first and last mission, and three in between. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, by the way, did you did you know my father? He was in the 512th at the same time. Ed Clendenin. 
I know the name, yes, but uh, I don't think I knew him over there. No. Well, you were, he was in the five twelfth at the same time. Yeah. He, Bond knows knows him or remembers him. Mm -hmm. I don't really okay, remember fine. him. No, uh, I know the name. I heard the name uh, oh, already. Looking for somebody yes. To him. Yeah. Uh, okay. And, uh, well, if you want to know about one other violent oh, Michigan. Oh, I want to all the people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bratislava, Czech Czechoslovakia. Uh -huh. It was another oil refinery thing. That's what we hit over at Ploesti, too, all right. the time. And uh, we were tail end Charlie. And uh, we were hit by quite a few German fighters. Uh -huh. And there was about six of them. Six uh, ME two tens, which was a twin twin engine German fighter, came in our on our tail. One of them pulled up at about eight o'clock, and I was shooting at him, and it blew up. So that's I can claim one. You claim one kill. Right? Yeah. Well, I can claim it, but uh, it wasn't necessarily verified because nobody else uh -huh. seen it. So, but I'm sure it blew up while I was shooting at it. So. <laughs> okay. So we got a presidential citation for that particular mission. We hit the target so good. So. Yeah, I think I remember reading about that Braswell mission, I mean the group getting the yeah. citation. Yeah. Uh, there was another mission I remember July 3rd to uh, Gur Guri, Guri got, the, the 512 lost three planes that day. I yeah. Think Vaughn, I think you. Yeah, Vaughn yeah, we were on there. Mission. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure. And Hillman got lost. Yeah, Gucci. Hillman. And um, Holgate. Yes, I remember that. Three of them. Yeah. Yes. And I think they were all, I think you were on the, the left box or the left wing. Yeah. And three of the planes went down and Bond pulled over because my yeah, dad was right. off. Yeah. And they lost, Hillman was flying next to my dad and I think Bond pulled in next to my dad. Yeah, I think that's when we were hit by uh, some uh, Messerschmitt yeah, 109s. Head on. Head on, yeah. And uh, they went by me so fast, uh, well, Dad I couldn't said, get a shot at it. Dad said they came out of the sun. Nobody, yeah. No, nobody right. saw them. That was Roma Romania, yeah, I remember that, yes, yeah, very well. That was my dad's last mission. Oh, yeah. So, anyway, uh, yes. apparently there, there was a lot of missions. Um, the, the, fighter, the fighters and the flak were. Yeah. Well, the flak was always there. Ploesti was just like flying through a black cloud. Uh -huh. And you could feel it, too. Every time they come close, uh, the plane moved. You could hear it. So and when, we're, we're, from a planning standpoint, when did you find out on a, on a given mission that that's where you were going? What, I assume early on is when the... Uh, when, when we had uh, a briefing? Uh, briefing, yes. They told us ahead of time. Yes. That yeah. you to <laughs> yeah. thinking about what am I doing here? Right, after that first mission, I said, oh my God, is this the way it is? <laughs> now, had so, you, before the first Pulaski mission, did you know about what Pulaski was or what it was? No, was no, no. It was just I mean, a name. That wasn't that, as far as I was concerned, it was. I didn't, the had no idea what it was. Had you heard about the uh, Operation Tidal Wave that had occurred? Yes, uh, in yeah, I heard about that. And, okay. and I think that first mission we was on, I think it was the second high-level mission right. after that. Uh-huh. So, okay. So that was in uh, August of uh, 43. And, Correct. Uh, and then in the meantime, we, they were moving up to uh, Italy. Right. Uh, it was, for some reason or another, the, the, the 15th Air Force never went back to Pulaski until you guys started going there. In the uh, first, according to my records, uh, it was uh, like, uh, there was one more right. before the one that we were on, the first right. one, yes. But then when you went there five times, that was when we went. Yeah. We as a, an Air Force went after. Yeah. So, so did you fly all of your missions with Vaughn, or did part of them? Uh, all except uh, about the last three. Okay. There was a pause for me. Uh, I had the GIs one time, and they, I couldn't fly for about two or three missions. So that set me back from the... The rest the from the rest of the crew, and I flew with uh, John Snyder, who was our commanding officer of the, uh -huh. for one mission. And uh, uh, 
I can't think of the name of the other pilot offhand, okay. but I flew with the two other ones. Now, when you were there, Gillette was the, was, was he the CEO at the yes. time? Yes, yeah. He was Snyder, a uh, the group. Group? Yeah. Okay, and Snyder replaced him, right? No, so. Snyder was a squadron, squadron. Okay. commander. Yeah. Okay, but Gillette was the group commander? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And um, when you were there, the, the Yugoslav detachment was... They were there, yeah. and uh, my bombardier flew with their one crew on one mission. We were down, we didn't, we didn't fly, and he flew with them, and on that mission, their engineer was killed on the plane that was, my bombardier was on. Vic Sorensen was his name. The one who was killed or your bombardier? He was the bombardier. Vic Sorensen was your Vic, bombardier? Vic Sorensen, yeah. Vic Sorensen, okay. And he was on that plane that that Yugoslavian engineer got killed. killed. Yeah, I knew that some of the um, American individuals would, would replace. The they fill in, the, yeah. The missing, mm -hmm. Or whatever reason. The it was just those two crews from Yugoslavia that was with us, yeah. And then one of them elevated, was lost, mm -hmm. I think. And yeah, I think so, of, yeah. One of them, Skakic, Skakic? Yeah, that sounds like right. Was, was a surviving <laughs> pilot. Yeah. 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 And their crews were primarily officers also, weren't they? Yeah. I think so. So the, the entire crew was pretty much officers flying what would be an enlisted Yeah, they're position. Yugoslavian right. army officers or Air Force officers, whatever they were. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So when did you finish up? It was in uh, September, I think in September. I finished my 50 missions. Okay. And I was over there two more months before I got to come back. Matter of fact, I got back on Christmas Day, back in the United States. Christmas Day of '44. Yeah. Okay. And uh, from there, I went to uh, gunnery instructor school, and then taught uh, aerial gunnery on B-29s. But only went through a couple of classes, and that's when the war ended in uh, in Germany, in '45. And so they didn't have any more classes, and then I just waited around to get discharged <laughs> so I got enough points. I had enough points, but you had to be in line. You had to be in line to be discharged? Yeah. So I assume you were discharged in late 45? Uh, in uh, yeah, September of 45. 45. Yes. Okay. But in the meantime, they were training you to be an instructor to explore the B-29? Yes. Okay. Did you ever fly in the B-29? No, I didn't. That okay. was a little bit of a luxury plane compared to the B-24, I guess. Because I was going to ask you what it was like. Because the B-29 uh, was pressurized and everything, and they didn't have to wear oxygen masks like we did. Yeah. And uh, I guess they had a little more heat. Uh-huh. All we had against that 40 below was a thin aluminum sheet metal. Sheet metal. And, yeah. And your uh, flight suit. Uh, yeah, flight suit. This was a summer flying jacket, but it never flew. It never flew. Because okay. it was always too cold. <laughs> it didn't matter what the year was, it was 40. Yeah, in the middle of summer, it was at least 40 degrees below zero up at 20,000 feet. Uh-huh. Now, when you, when you were over there, was the, uh, did you see a decline or think there was a decline in the, the number of German fighters that were intercepting you? Towards the end, yes. Uh, when we got to the last part of our number of missions, uh -huh. there we, we could sometimes could see them on the ground that they didn't take off, and it was, I think it was probably because they didn't have fuel, fuel. because we hit their refinery so often uh -huh. that we had to give them a hard time, I'm sure. But you could see the German planes just sitting on the ground? Some, and towards the end, they did have a few jets. I saw one. You saw an ME-262? One, yeah, it was a, one, of the, one of their original ones, I guess, that uh -huh. took off. Uh, with wheels, and they dropped them, and they landed on skids. But they could only fly for a short time. They'd probably take one bass, I guess, and that was it. Were they flying around your uh, formation at all? I only seen the one went by. Okay. But he went by your plane. Yeah. Were you trying to shoot it? Uh, he went by too fast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Did you wonder what that was? Yeah. They they told us later. Uh, wow. But thanks to their shortage of fuel, I guess they couldn't use them or. or uh -huh. Wasn't able to. Okay. But we had some good fighters at that time too. But by the time we got that far, you were getting escorted by the 
people, right? yeah. When we first got over there, we had very few. When we first took off, we'd have some, but they couldn't go as far as the target. So. But towards the end, we had quite a few escorts. When one reads about the, the, the Tuskegee Airmen, were they, did they ever escort you? I don't know if it was them, but we had P-51s, and I assume it was because they were based there. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, but at the time, I didn't know that was them. Okay, so but were they successful in keeping the uh, fighters yeah. away? Yeah, yeah. When they were up there, we didn't see they anything didn't else. Anything. Yeah. Okay. So they would escort you into the IP, and then All right. they would and pull away. Right, they'd... we'd go through the flak. And they would. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. And I guess they'd pick you up on after you yes. left. Usually, yes. Usually, yes. Target yeah. back. Yeah. Okay. How long were you actually in on a given mission? When did you actually get into the turret and man your gun? Uh, only not long after uh, we took off. As soon as they, as soon as they got into formation, uh, we got up into turrets and the good positions and had to test fire the guns and things uh -huh. like that. You had to have your oxygen mask and everything because about twelve thousand feet, you had to be all set. You had to have oxygen. And so Jenny, so how, so for mission was 10 hours, you, so you were probably in the In that seat. Eight or yeah. nine hours? Right. That's a long time. To That's that. a long time to sit in one place and, and you're very confined. Uh -huh. And I don't, I don't think I could do it now. Well, but I guess that. <laughs> did you guys rotate around? Like, did you ever say, gee, I'd like to be in the tail? No, I always, always flew the top turret. Always, always top turret, okay. Yeah. I guess that's what most of my training was in, uh -huh. in, in gunnery school, and uh, flight gunnery school. Was there a difference in how the turrets worked? I, I, I don't know. No, I, mean, I don't, don't think so, no. Pretty much all the same? Yeah. It was just getting used to the, to the right. particular layout of the yeah, gun. Probably the only difference, mine would go all the way around, like the nose turret could only go so far, and tail only so far. And the waste gunners was just one single gun that they used. Right. Yeah. So, so being up the up in the top turret, I, you almost had a, the same view as the pilot, bird's eye view. Of just about. Yeah, I couldn't see the uh, target too much until he banked away, and when he banked away and stuff like uh -huh. that, I can see that. Uh, so you could be sitting there watching the flak. Coming, right. Yeah. Coming up ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take a lot of flak hits? Oh, yeah. Almost everyone over Ploesti would come back with holes and holes, stuff. Yeah. Uh, just by a miracle, I guess none of our crew got hit. Hmm. But we had lots of holes. And, uh, yeah. Never lost a crew? None of your no. crew got seriously injured? No. Okay. It's one of those lucky things. Did you maintain contact with your other crewmates after, after your service? Yeah, we, there's uh, five of us left, and uh, I email the, my no, um, bombardier, the radio operator, and Vaughn Steele. Uh -huh. I still correspond with the ball turret gunner. He lives in York, Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. Robert Morgart, his name. And uh, we just lost uh, a nose gunner in fact. Memorial Day, this last Memorial Day. Hmm. And where the other ones I don't, don't, don't know. remember, or don't I know, know. I've seen Vaughn at the rear. Do the other ones you commute ever come to the, to the reunions? Or? No, to my knowledge, no. And we don't know why. Uh, but you communicate with them? But we do. We tell them when it's going to be. And I know my ball turret kind of never liked to travel, so I guess that's why he never come. But he belongs to the... Oh, but he does belong. belong to the... Yeah, reunion okay. group, yeah. And Thornton, you said, was the bombardier? Yes. He's another one you maintain contact yes, with? Yes, uh, with email. Okay. So, yeah. okay. Um, kind of, is there any, anything else in particular? You were describing some pretty hairy missions. Oh, that uh, first mission when we uh, crashed off of the left side of the runway uh -huh. was even more... Uh, or more worse, I should say, after a while, because uh, we were out watching one of the return missions come back and landing, uh -huh. and one of the planes uh, blew a tire, right tire on their plane, uh -huh. and it veered off to the right side of the runway and into some rocks, and it blew up. 
It blew up. And there was nothing left. Nothing. Uh, they returned from a mission and they still had their bombs on board. So, it, uh, so thank heaven we went off on the left side instead of the right side. Wasn't a common practice that if you came back from a mission you would drop your bombs in the head? Or that a lot of times, yes. But why, why they sometimes they kept them, I don't know. That one was canceled before it was bad weather, but maybe they knew it right away and decided to come back. I don't remember, but uh, this one had the bombs on board. And you, you guys were still standing around watching it? Yeah, and all of a sudden, boom, yeah. Wow. Alongside the runway, yeah. I know there was a mission in November where the plane came back, November 44. The plane came back. I don't know why because it was the same incident. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there was another one. Because there's a lady who comes to, who used to come to the reunion whose cousin was on was on board that plane and mm -hmm. landed and flew his plane. But those are some of the things that happened. And uh, like I say, I was one of the fortunate ones that none of those things did happen. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Okay. And besides that, all the other ones were kind of hairy too. <laughs> I, I would imagine there's no such thing as a milk run. Oh, uh, they called them some of that, but none of them were. <laughs> none of them were. Okay. What kind of an operational thing? You would fly so many missions, and then would they send you an R and R? Or uh, sometimes what? they did, but I never. We never did. I they never, never got to. An R &R. No, some of them got to go to the Isle of Capri. This little bell here came from there, but I didn't. <laughs> I would say my dad, I know went on. A, I went on R and R to the Isle of Capri. Yeah. Apparently that wasn't common practice. No, I don't know how some got to go there and some didn't. But okay. Yeah. But we just kept flying until the missions were done. You didn't fly every mission, of course. Sure. But uh, until you got your fifty in, and then. So what was life like at the base when you weren't flying? It was uh, reasonably comfortable. We five of us lived in a pyramid tent, and uh -huh. not too terribly much room. And at first, uh, all you had was a cot and two blankets, and it got pretty cold over there in uh, early spring too. Uh -huh. And uh, we finally commandeered some mattress covers and uh -huh. spilled them with straw, and we would use those on the. Bunk and it gradually improved. We put eventually put a wooden floor in it, uh -huh. out of uh, ammunition cases, and sure. such things, and put a door on a tent. Those things you did yourself, you know, and gradually improved it. But we still always lived in those pyramid tents. Those five sure. of us. Yeah. Was there a lot of intermingling between the crews? Oh yeah, we always got along together. Our crew got along really good, uh -huh. and uh, we had our. NCO club. Okay. It's good. And when we first got over there, all we had for a mess tent was one big tent. Uh -huh. And there was lots of flies, animals, and everything else. Were <laughs> well, the mess uh, tents for all the enlisted men? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, most of the officers lived in the uh, uh, tents too, right. except some of the higher levels. They lived in our headquarters building. Uh -huh. We had a, one headquarters building for the squadron there. And uh, Eventually, they had the Italians build us a mess hall. A group of us went out with a big truck and com com commanded there some uh, telephone poles for roof beams and things like that, and they eventually made us a mess hall with screen around it. And we, well, we was living in luxury, luxury then. <laughs> so the Italians did all, all a lot of the, the a lot of the labor. Yeah, they labor hired. Labor. Yes, right. Yeah. Okay. And, did you have, I mean, did, did the guys pay them or did the, did the squadron? I the assume they did. I, assumed, I have no idea how they arranged that, but I guess they must have paid them some way. <laughs> did, you go into, did you go into town a lot? Uh, Leachy was the closest town. It was a pretty good sized town. Okay. San Pancrazio was just a cross street. Okay. And uh, we used to go in there. You had to go by truck. But, uh, we'd go in every one, couple of weeks or something. I mean, we'd be able to go in. Uh huh. And also uh, near Taranto was our uh, beach, you might say. It was on the Mediterranean. I've seen pictures of a, of a beach. Yeah, I'm they had a, a raft out in the middle, and we'd, we was able to go there 
Uh -huh. Every once in a while to go swimming in the How summertime. How far away was that? Not too far. Uh, we go, we go by truck again, and uh, it only take maybe half hour to get there, something like that. So would you like decide to go to Lychee if you were standing down one day and you had a day off or a couple of days off? Would you spend the night in Lychee? Or, no, or what uh, no, we weren't through. supposed to do that. You weren't supposed to communicate with. I mean, you weren't supposed to go along right with the, the the natives or something. My radio operator could do it. He was an Italian, and uh, he could oh, speak the language pretty good. And he he got in with some pretty good families, I think. So, so. you would like go maybe for a dinner or, or what? No, we what didn't. Was, they had an end, they had a USO club there where you could get some donuts and cookies, but that's about it. Plenty of wine. You could all uh -huh. get all the wine you could drink, but okay. uh, but basically that's all we did: sightseeing, and maybe you could buy things. Uh, yeah. We're how. How uh, informed were you, were you about what was going on in the military campaign? Like, Mark, we were trying to take the uh, Italy, and then, we, like, we took Rome in June of '44, and then there was. Yeah, uh, they, uh, the the line was between Naples and uh, Rome when we got over there, uh -huh. uh, and we was kept uh, uh, up on what was going on. Yeah. And there were you did fly some missions into northern Italy, right? Yeah, we did. Uh -huh. a, lot of, a lot of marshalling yards and things like that where they put trains together, uh -huh. try to bridges and stuff like that in northern Italy. Yeah. And did you uh, also support the, the landing in France? Like yes, France? yes we did. Uh, and uh, one of our targets over there was Toulon, France, where the Germans had their sub pens. Uh -huh. That was one of our longest missions. That was a long, long way to fly. Matter of fact, one of the missions we come back, we were running so low on gas, we lost a couple engines, and I think we landed on with two engines. And oh, okay. I think my pilot said we had about 25 gallons of gas left. So if we wouldn't have made it on that pass, we wouldn't have made it. <laughs> hmm. So well, you were going to land regardless. Huh? Right. Okay. Um, well, maybe going back in time, you. You said you turned 18 in in, in uh, 43. 43. Yeah. Okay. What? That was two years after Pearl Harbor, right? Yes. 21. Yeah. Okay. What? What was life like between the time of Pearl Harbor and? Uh, it was uh, pretty good for us. Things weren't uh, too tight. Of course, they came up with uh, rationing and all the stuff for gas and stuff like that. But before that. Uh, uh, it wasn't too bad when I was in high school. Was it you were in high school at the time? Yeah, and, uh, and I don't remember anything serious, uh, uh, any serious problems except gas, mostly, and sugar. Sugar was very, very short, yeah. And, uh, well, where you could work, you had to work where there was defense things. I worked on a, a small airport when the war started. Uh, there wasn't most used for that, uh -huh. and I went into a uh, sheet metal manufacturing company and because they were doing defense contracts. Mm -hmm. and that's what I was doing when, when I was drafted. When Uncle Sam said, please, right. please help us. Sir. Yeah, you're, you're 1A. <laughs> so assuming you graduated high school in June and then you got your draft notice. And in the fall, on, fall, fall, no, in the fall of uh, that year, yeah. Okay. School I went to went, went all year round. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I think we had two weeks vacation. It was uh, aviation high school is what it was. I was like I said, I was learning to be an aviation mechanic, and we did shop work and we did academics. Uh, that's we went, went all year round. You kind of jokingly hear that whatever you're good at, the military make sure you don't do that. Was, yeah. <laughs> was your background in aviation helpful? Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess so, because they knew I liked flying, and I was going to be a pilot and aircraft mechanic. And I liked flying. Yeah. Well, did you consider trying to try to get into pilot school? I would have, and I and I was thinking very seriously after I got out, but my wife didn't like uh, flying, so. Well, what about when you enlisted? What did you think about trying to become an officer and become a pilot or a bombardier, or, uh, or were you happy with? I didn't have much choice at that time. They oh, just told that you were going to do this. You know, that was it. After I was drafted, I guess I. I see. And well, I don't recall getting a choice anyway. <laughs> no, I, 
Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they didn't. Yeah. They just sent you. To, you're going to go become a gunner. Yeah. Because I was always your mechanic. They might have tried to make you a flight engineer. That's what I thought too. But I guess uh, at that time they had enough of those and needed some other uh, armor armors and. So what did an armor? It, do. I mean, I, well, I, uh, in armament school, you learned about all the guns, all the uh, any kind of gun that you could fire. In, in this, uh, mainly the 50 caliber machine gun, which what, what, what we used mostly. So your job was to maintain the guns on the front. Right, and you had to be able to take it apart and put it back together, blindfold it, and all that sort of thing. So was it your job after the mission to to re re arm? Re -arm I uh, would, would help, uh, but they, we had an armament shop. Uh, oh. that, that would do most of that, but anything that come up, I would help with it. Yeah. But so if you're in the air and tail gunner said my gun is jammed, yeah, then it would be my job to, to, to do fix it. it. Right. Did that happen very often? Nope, it never happened while I was there. Because early on in the war, when you hear back in '42, people talk about the guns freezing because of the oil. I assume they had fixed that problem by the time. Well, they were, no, they, they never ever froze up. Okay. Uh, once in a while they jam. I think on one time I was firing it, one of them jammed, but it was just a matter of a, one of the shells hooked up, and I, all I could reach up and pull it loose, and it and was all right. So there was nothing wrong with the gun, really. Okay. So, but that would happen. Uh, okay. So you, they, you, were, you were drafted, and then um, they sent you to gunnery school, and then you then, if I remember right, you went to Westover, where the crew uh, uh, after after armament school, I went back to uh, aerial gunnery school. I, aerial gun. okay. That was back down in Florida, down Fort Myers, Florida, where you uh, did a lot of skeet shooting and uh, all kinds of uh, aerial shooting. You would go up in uh, AT-6s and other planes and shoot at targets that they trailed and learn, learning aerial gunnery. So all the students in your class, all that was their primarily what they were being trained for. Right. I mean, you weren't there with radar or whatever. I mean, that was... That was that's strictly, strictly aerial gunnery. At that mm -hmm. point in time, did you know you were going to go into the top turret? Or yeah. You... No, yeah. I'm pretty sure of it, yeah. Okay. Uh, we um, even used to do skeet shooting on a moving base on the back end of a truck, riding around a... I've heard that. Uh, an oval. Yeah. And birds fly out here and that way. It was quite interesting. <laughs> I got fairly decent at it, I should say. But uh, so after that, then you went to Westover. Went to uh, no, we went to uh, Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City, okay. And we're assigned to a crew. That's where we got together. That's where you met Vaughn and everybody. Yeah, and uh, from there we went to uh, Pueblo, Colorado, and that's where we started the crew training. And we flew together in like in formation. We did. Uh, like ground strafing and uh, all kind of things with with the B-24 at that sure. time. And how long was that? Uh, we was only there for two or three weeks doing that when we got transferred to Westover Field and then we finished uh, uh, the training there, doing the same thing. Uh -huh. uh, flying formations and uh, that sort of thing and you were with other, other planes. When you were going through training, were they D-models? Yes, uh, a lot of them were. But they didn't. But when you ferry, I assume you did not ferry a D model. Over. No, it was it was a J. A J model with a turret on the front. Okay. Was there a significant difference? Uh, the D models, D models didn't have a turret on the front. They just just had two guns poked out through the uh -huh. the greenhouse that's on the front, and then they come up with a turret on the front, and that was uh, the J model. So what did the nose gunner? the guy who was going to become the nose gunner do when you were flying an E-model and he didn't have a, he had to uh, wait for the J to show up before he Well, the, the bombardier would be up there too and the nose gunner would be there too. I guess uh, the bombardier could use one gun and the nose gunner could use the other at that time, I, I guess. I, <laughs> I I don't remember what happened, although we did fly, fly some of those over there. Matter of fact, uh, my pilot says we flew the Strawberry Pitch, which is the one that's at uh, Dayton Air Force Base. Uh, museum. 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 Yeah. Right. Right, Patterson. Correct. Yeah. When they, we had a re reunion in Cincinnati yeah. two or three years ago. Yeah, right. And 
they had a little ceremony. We all drove up to yeah up to Dayton, and they had a little ceremony for the by that airplane. Yeah, airplane. that was one of ours in the five twelve. And I don't were you at that particular yes, union? Yes, I was there. Yeah, yeah. They asked for people to come up who yeah who had flown in the strawberry pitch, and yeah. I remember Vaughn going up and yeah standing up there. On, yeah. And he should know he was a pilot. You don't remember that. <laughs> not, uh, not particularly. I know it was there, you know, because sure. uh, I think I got a picture of myself alongside of it when we was over there. Or something. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I don't remember when it left, but I guess they flew it back for the just to be going into that museum. I guess. Well, actually, I think they flew it back, and they were going to uh, destroy it at, at Davis Monson. Some officer at Davis Monson had something for the, he, he knew about the Strawberry Bitch and he knew Dayton was asking for B-24 representatives to put it in the museum and he he picked that airplane and saved it. Yeah. And had it uh, it's a good thing he did because there's very few of them left anymore. The, there's one flying that uh, used to be called the All-American, then it was called uh, Dragon's Tail, and it's called something else, yeah. but it flies around the United States yet. And uh, that's the only one, I think, that flies, B-24. So. And uh, there again, uh, when I was, when I had enough points to get out, I was waiting in line. <laughs> they, they sent us, supposedly sent us close to home, but I wound up in Lubbock, Texas, and that was one of the places where they were cannibalizing the, the B, or they were storing them actually, the B-24s. They had hundreds of them sitting out in the field. Uh -huh. Brand new B-24s, and they were uh, mothballing them really at that time. And uh, it's a shame, I understand all those were scrapped. Uh -huh. Some beautiful airplanes, they could have saved a few of them anyway. Well, we did not, unfortunately. So yeah. when you got out, what, what, what did, what did when you got back to Kimmy Civilian, what did, what did you do? Well, I took off a few weeks, and my previous employer called me and wanted to know if I was coming back to work, so I went back to work to the, in that uh, sheet metal industry. Okay. Yeah, and uh, that's where I stayed. Oh, okay. <laughs> For quite a few years. Okay. 46, I guess it was, I stayed there. Yeah. This was in Ohio? Cincinnati, Ohio. Cincinnati, yes. Ohio? Yeah, we, we did industrial sheet metal work uh, all over the country. Uh-huh. Air not air conditioning, air cooling, dust collecting systems, all that sort of thing. You mentioned your, your wife. Did, did you know her when you were in the service? I knew her before I went in, but uh, we didn't, we weren't you steady were, dating or anything like that while I was in, no. I was going to ask if you wrote to each other at all. Oh, yes, yes, yes. But I wrote to other ones, too. Well, okay. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, so uh, re limiting the field, then. but anyway. But it wasn't long after we got back, we started dating regularly and uh -huh. uh, got married in 1948. Oh, okay. And from then on, it was raising a family. <laughs> what did your, uh, did you have brothers or sisters? I had a, one brother. Uh, he was in the Navy. He was on the cruiser Boise, USS Boise. Uh -huh. And one sister. And then that's all in the family. So he, your brother was in the service when you were in? Yeah, he was older than I was, and he enlisted in the, the Navy. Was he in the Pacific? Uh, I mean, I... I uh, yeah. yeah, yes, he was, because okay. he was in Australia and a few other places. And what battles he was in, I don't know, but uh, he was active. Did you know what he was doing, and did he know what you were doing? During the war? No. No? He knew our, uh, what I was in, and I knew what he was in, but what, what we that were doing, I know. I had no idea. Were, you, were your parents kind of anxious to having both sons out yeah. in the war? Oh, yeah. I'm sure the they theater? were. Yeah. Yeah. And we it was both in uh, combat, and both of us got back. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Was there anything else? We're thinking, I've got some other quite standard questions I could ask, but I wanted to give you the case of well, I had offhand. I think of anything particular whether you want to ask. Okay. Um, 
some of the questions we were we've been at, talking about was uh, uh, the, the, the depression was a significant player before the before the war started and uh, depression the economic situation changed when we went into the war yes it picked up before that it was it's quite difficult quite difficult. Uh, yeah it's hard to get find a job and Hard to find a job that paid anything. Uh -huh. I think when I worked on that airport, I got twelve dollars a week. And of course, I was partly in high school and partly working at that time until I got that. And when I got this other job, it wasn't paying a heck of a lot more, but it did, did pay more than twelve dollars a week. And so you consider yourself a little bit lucky that you even had a job. Yes, because uh, well, there just wasn't that many jobs around, uh -huh. and a lot of people waiting for jobs. Uh -huh. But as soon as the war started, then, well, matter of fact, uh, while I was doing that, we had the WPA for people that couldn't find jobs. Uh -huh. That's when Roosevelt developed that program. To, Some of the veterans that said they were in the CCC or the... Yeah, three C's yeah. was another one. A lot of people went in the three C's. And, uh -huh. and I was a little bit too young for that, I guess. Sure. Uh, but that was the conditions then. Uh -huh. and, but all the defense contracts that they put out put a lot of people to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Wright engine plant was built in Cincinnati, and that put thousands of people to work. Mm -hmm. Wright Cyclone. Right. So was that related to the Wright Patterson Air Force Base? No, no, that was no, that was just the name of that just motor. Yeah, and that's the one that was used on the B-17. We used uh, Pratt Whitney on, on B twenty fours. They argued which one's better. I don't know uh, which ones. <laughs> well, they argue which plane is better too. I think it depends upon whether or not you flew B twenty fours or B seventeen. Right. Yeah. So. Okay. Um. What? We were discussing the Italians. What? So, some of the veterans have commented that they, they they kind of felt that the Italians might be might have been spying for for the Germans when they were over there. Did you get any sort of sense of? No, of that? I didn't. We uh, got it, got along with most most of them pretty good, uh, as much as you could communicate with them. Uh -huh. After a while, you learned enough Italian that you could get. Across some things, uh -huh. and well, in San Pancrazio, I'm sure there wasn't anything like that. There was just peasants that lived in San Pancrazio. The only uh, scare that we, that I know of, we had some German planes flew over at night, and they was afraid of paratroopers and stuff like that. So the, the Germans flew over. Yeah, at hand. night, uh, to, and they knew they, they were Germans' planes, and from that time on. The air crews had to put night guard duty on if you weren't flying the next day. It was one of the more unpleasant things because you had to stay awake all night. So uh, you, you standing guard on the planes in case. The planes? Yeah. How many times did you have to do that? Well, I guess uh, half a dozen times or more. Not every night, but it, uh, if you weren't flying the next day, you, just, you, pulled guard you got picked. Uh, yeah. Huh. Just uh, enlisted men. <laughs> Well, a uh, ground crew took care of it during the day, but they sure. was afraid of uh, paratroopers yeah, that came in, might have tried sabotage or whatever sure. at, at that time. And I guess that lasted until I got done flying my missions. <laughs> I don't know whether they stopped after a while or not, but I know I had to stand night guard duty. Huh. Okay. Yeah. When you um, got through your service, there were some crews that were were uh, slated to go out to the Pacific. I take you that was not. I uh, never was never was going to do that. Was it going to? Uh, it never came up. I never, it was never approached up because they sent me to gunnery instructor school, and uh, I don't think they kept us for 
flying. If there was a, an emergency, I'm sure they would have. Yeah. If the war would have changed, I'm sure they would have. And we were, we were doing much better at that time, uh -huh. making gains. Uh -huh. So it was never approached. Okay. I know um, some of the groups, like the 98th, uh, wound up going over to the South Pacific, uh, and they were there over there when the Korean War and stuff come out. But I don't think the 376 did. No, they did not. No. I know they were. They packaged them up in April. Yeah. And returned them. And some of the fellows at that point in time thought they might have been going out mm -hmm. to the out to the Pacific Theater, but that never happened. Yeah. I wasn't aware until you just said it that the 98th. The 98th, because I have I have friends back home that uh, were with the 98th when they were over in Korea. And, or in some place over there. I don't know where they were based, but uh, some place over there. Well, that reminds you that reminds you then the 98th was also flying out of Italy. When, right. Did you, was there any mingling or mixing of, of guys from the 98th and the region? No, region? they were, I don't know where they were based. I think Foggia or, or someplace, I don't know, but it was quite a distance away from where we were. Okay. And uh, even when we flew, we'd fly on our own group, mm -hmm. uh, usually a lot of the same targets, but in different rotations. Sure. Uh, yeah, so. there wasn't and, even, was there much mingling between the five, between squadrons within the seven, within the 376, like 512, 513? Oh, yeah. There was a lot of, there was a fair number of them. A certain amount, yeah, because uh, I know we used to go have to go across the field to see the movies once in a while. Uh -huh. That's where they had the uh, makeshift theater set up. And we knew some of the people in the other, but not too many, because uh, a lot of the crews were in and out. To, sure. They didn't stay very long. I remember seeing some of the, um, the 376 had a little publication, if I'm not mistaken, that was a little newspaper or something. Oh, uh, like we have the, around. now we have the. No, I mean, but I mean back then, did, wasn't there something during the a little newspaper? Uh, the. I guess what, let me ask the question about what I was going to ask. Yeah. There are a lot of, the, one of the flavors I seem to think about is that there seem to be some athletic type competitions, softball teams, ball. No, no, we never did anything like that, no. Nothing like that, okay. I guess uh, there wasn't time to organize anything of <laughs> that okay. sort. It was always doing something else. Okay. No. And you mentioned Brett, Brett Flavia, the, the group got a, I think you said you mentioned Brett Flavia as being a tough mission. Didn't, did, and your group got a, got a citation for that, right? Uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, Bratislava, we right. did, yeah. And the group got uh, two other uh, presidential citations. Uh, offhand, I can't think, remember what they were, but uh, that's the one I knew about because I was there. <laughs> now, did you get a, did, the, did the, each of the individual crewmen who were on that mission, did they get some sort of uh, there's uh, just a, a blue uh, metal with uh, gold around it. Which was an indication? In, that that's indicates the, the presidential citation, yeah. Okay. So you have something that you could wear that yeah. I was on? Yeah, with, with the rest of the ribbons. Okay. Uh, they didn't give out too many ribbons back then. Didn't give <laughs> Not like they do today. Don't seem like because some of these nowadays they got rows and rows and rows up. <laughs> so how many medals did, did you get? I got uh, four uh, air medals and uh, well, a good conduct medal as you get, and uh, I have a, even a European theater ribbon with seven battle stars and uh, the victory medal. Uh, at that Bratislava mission, uh, I was interviewed by Wiley Golden. He was one of the guys that started the, the 376 reunions. Right. And he was sort of like a publicity officer of some kind over there. Uh -huh. And he, he said he was going to put me in for a DFC, but nothing ever happened nothing ever because happened. of that mission. Oh, and on that mission, uh, I had got two holes in the dome of the turret, too. Oh, okay. Yeah. From flak, uh, flak bullets. I would assume know. because we weren't we weren't in flak at that time, when the when the fighters were hitting, okay. and uh, 
from then on, it was quite drafty. And uh, cold, <laughs> colder than cold. Than cold. <laughs> yeah. So, because Wiley, you mentioned Wiley Gordon, he was he was active in the in the uh, Veterans Association. But yeah, he was, was one of the well, that helped start this uh, right. uh, veterans group. Yeah. But the interview when he said he was going to put you in for the DFC, that was actually during. Well, yeah, this, I was, that was right, yeah, right after the mission. He, he would in, interview a lot of them after missions just to get stories right. uh, to put in local papers. Matter of fact, he uh, worked on a Cincinnati paper before he went into the service. I don't know which one, but he worked on a Cincinnati paper. And I guess he put some of the articles. I had a picture of me in from, for something one time. My mother kept, uh -huh. I think I still got it. But anyhow, uh, nothing ever came of that, so. You had to have a lot of proof and everything else to get uh, any kind of. Did you keep a diary you know? when you were over there? Oh yeah, I kept notes, no. and I got a list of all the missions that I was on. I didn't bring it with me. I should have. <laughs> I was going to say, if you, if you're willing, we'd love to add that that to our archives and, and just descriptions and recollections you had about the missions. I could send you a copy. Oh, of absolutely. It. I mean, it'd be copy. Yeah. I yeah. Would, yeah. If you give me uh, an address. Or, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And you said you had a picture of you with, with the strawberry bitch when you were over there? Uh, I think I have someplace. Uh, okay. I got a picture of it. It, it, I know, when it was sitting out in the field. And whether I got, I got one of me alongside of one of the other planes with, the, with this along it. That, but uh, the, there much, much, wasn't much cameras over there at that time. You, any, well, yeah, but any it's photograph, a shame, too. Any photographic records? Is, is, they're rare. Do you, do you have a crew photo, for example, of all, of all your guys? Yeah. Uh, we got a crew uh, picture uh, when we were at Western Over Field, uh -huh. alongside of the plane. I could send you one of them, too. Absolutely. Any, any, any things like that, we'd, we'd love to add to our archive. If you give me the right address. I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you my mailing address. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, anything else? But, okay. Um, I'm kind of running out of yeah. things. Uh, I guess we've pretty well covered everything that I can think of. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for your uh, time. And it was an honor to talk with you about that. Well, you're very welcome. So, long, glad I could do it. Glad, glad I didn't get stage fright. No, you did very well. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. <laughs>